Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 616, Love. Today is my lucky day to encounter such a beautiful lady. Could I be luckier to buy you a drink? The woman's eyes flickered and a smile graced her lips. She gently shook her head, indicating that his offer wasn't accepted. Undeterred, Flores wanted to say more, but he noticed the woman's expression cooling off, prompting him to retreat to his seat. In the following moments, he alternated between stealing glances at the woman's figure, clad in a simple shirt and slender black pants, and observing the rim of her glass, watching it touched by her moist red lips. Flores's body heated up, and his mouth grew dry. The more beer he drank, the harder it became to quench his thirst. Eventually, the woman finished her light gold manzan, placed the tall glass on the bar counter, and gracefully left amid the soothing and elegant music. Flores hurriedly approached, pulling out a soft tissue that had gained popularity in recent years. He wiped the edge of the wine glass where the woman's lips had just touched. Then he folded the tissue, meticulously scanning the surroundings of the bar stool. He collected a few flaxen-colored long hairs, securing them in the tissue. Completing this task, Flores became aware of the bartender and the nearly twenty male customers around him, all staring with a shared judgmental gaze, pervert. Flores wasn't the sole victim of the woman's enchantment, it extended to all the men and a few women in the bar. All of them had witnessed his perverted actions. Despite the accusatory stares, Flores kept his composure and left as if nothing had transpired. He vowed never to return to this bar again, yet he harbored no regret for his actions. On the way back to the apartment, Flores's heart pulsed with anticipation, fueled by the promise of gains. His pace quickened, though practicality dictated a more measured speed. Upon reaching his residence, he drew the curtains and retrieved an old notebook with a yellowed cover from his suitcase compartment. Inside, a mottled note held a complex vocabulary that didn't belong to any language from the northern continent, accompanied by numerous instructions in Highlander. Flores eagerly placed the tissue containing the woman's hair and saliva on the notebook. He then took up the mottled note, reciting the intricate and peculiar words with marked pronunciation. Neighbordously. This was the love incantation Flores had chanced upon. With the true name, date of birth, closely related items, or bodily fluids like flesh and blood, he could insert the medium in his notebook and recite the incantation seven times, compelling the target to fall irrevocably in love. Flores had patiently waited for the opportune moment to orchestrate Pedro's daughter, Sala, to fall and be injured. His timely aid had not only garnered gratitude, but also facilitated the collection of her blood, fulfilling the conditions for the love incantation. Reality had validated the enchanting power of the love incantation. Flores refrained from using it again, uncertain of how to dispel its effects. If pursued by multiple women before his marriage to Sala, provoking a conflict among them could jeopardize his standing within the large family and hinder access to resources and support. However, today was different. She was the most captivating woman he had ever encountered. He was ready to pay any price to make her his own. Uncertainty lingered in Flores's mind about whether the saliva-stained tissue and the naturally fallen hair could truly serve as a medium for the love incantation, but the desire to find out overwhelmed any reservations. Excitement and anticipation surged within him as he envisioned the possibility of witnessing such a beautiful scene, an uncontrollable smile gracing his face. Now Bordisley. Flores continued reciting the love incantation with abnormal devotion and enthusiasm, his heart pulsating with desire and joy. Now Bordisley. After repeating it seven times, Flores watched in amazement as the tissue and hair burst into flames, reflecting a rainbow before swiftly turning to ashes. Success, success, Flores couldn't initially believe it, but immense joy struck his heart. Surprise lingered, but Flores cared little. What mattered was that it worked, that captivating woman is now in love with me. Thoughts of what would unfold next raced through Flores's mind. He hastily closed the notebook, clipped the note, and dashed to the door without bothering to put them away. He yearned to walk the streets, confident that the lovely person must be seeking him. 
As Flores swung the door open, there she was the woman from the bar, standing outside. Flores's entire being went slack under the lake-colored crystalline gaze, his balance teetering on the edge of surrender. Every fiber of his being yearned to yield. As the woman willingly stepped into Flores's embrace, he eagerly enveloped her in his arms, leaning in for a kiss. Yet, the sensation he encountered was far from the warmth and softness he had imagined. Instead, it was cold and unyielding. W.H. Flores's surprise turned to shock as he realized he was embracing a waist-high mirror. The mirror brushed against his chest, swaying back and forth, resisting his attempts to disengage. Flores recoiled in unnatural fear. The lingering sensations from his earlier fantasies refused to dissipate. His heart froze while his body burned. With mounting dread, he struck the mirror with increasing force. Finally, retreating to his suitcase, Flores delivered a decisive blow, shattering the mirror with a resounding crack. It shattered into countless fragments, piercing Flores's clothes, chest, stomach, and arms. Agony surged through Flores's body, searing his senses, snapping the fraying nerve that was already on the brink. In that moment, he tasted a euphoria unlike any other. Collapsing to the ground, Flores lay motionless, caught between fear, longing, anguish, and ecstasy. It can truly assist in digesting the pleasure potion, Franca clicked her tongue, observing the scene unfold in the mirror of the apartment diagonally opposite Flores's room. With her expertise, the spectacle before her could be deemed a novelty. I assured you I wouldn't deceive you, Lumian, sporting a golden straw hat, responded with a grin. Upon accepting the commission and identifying Flores's primary problem of inexplicably garnering the fervent affection of a stunning girl, Lumian's initial instinct was to deploy a demoness to test this individual. Franca's saliva and hair served as part of the investigation. After all, mysticism likely played a role. Naturally, for safety precautions, Franca had treated the saliva and hair beforehand. Thus, she devised a mirror substitution, a dark magic of witches, which accurately connected to them. Now, the results were in splendid. Franca had subjected Flores to pleasure's torment, exposing him to the agony of chasing fleeting satisfaction. Curious, Flores managed to ensnare my mirror's affection with just a single word incantation. No ritual or supplication to any entity, Franca mused with emotion. Even I can't achieve that. Lumian chuckled in response, remarking, You can. No incantation or medium needed. Just unleash your charm. Franca was taken aback. You're starting to resemble an intision. Or is this a result of your Potter education? Pursing her lips, her gaze flickered. Lumian continued, There's another issue. Pedro previously tasked two adventurers with probing Flores, but they vanished and it appears this fellow lacks Bayonder powers. Franca suddenly smiled. This is intriguing. If the mirror substitution failed and I fell under the sway of that incantation, falling in love with Flores, what would you do? Lumian emitted a soft chuckle. Making someone vanish without a trace is simple. I don't even need to lift a finger. Lumian was confident Ludwig could consume the fellow entirely with counter-divination to top it off. Without awaiting Franca's response, Lumian headed for the door. I'll pay that fellow a visit. Keep vigilant for any developments and beware of mishaps. Understood, Franca replied solemnly. As Flores hadn't managed to close the door in time, Lumian found the entrance accessible without the need to pry it open. Sensing the intrusion, Flores snapped out of his daze, hastily rising to his feet. By this point, Lumian had already picked up the notebook, unfolding it to the two pages displaying the mottled note. W, what are you doing? Flores asked, horror etched across his face. He immediately recognized Lumian. Louis Berry? The great adventurer Louis Berry? Did Pedro hire you to investigate me? Ignoring the inquiry, Lumian walked toward the window, ushering in a gust of fresh air. A love incantation can make a woman fall in love with you. All you need is to obtain her true name. Lumian began reciting the Highlander annotation on the modeled note in front of Flores. The incantation's pronunciation is... 
he abruptly halted without completing the recitation. Flores's face had already turned a sickly grayish white, as if he could foresee the impending demise of his reputation and his capture by the church. Where did this come from? Lumian pointed at the mottled note and the old notebook. Cold sweat broke out on Flores's forehead and his eyes gradually turned fierce. Suddenly, he shouted, pronouncing the word in a rugged and awkward tone, Nebordesli. This time, there was no target or corresponding medium. Almost simultaneously, Lumian sensed his surroundings fall silent as an ominous aura rapidly enveloped the room. Chapter 617 Transaction he raised his gaze, Lumian's dark hair and green eyes reflecting in his now ominous stare. Lumian's suppressed emotions, desires, and the haze surrounding him erupted like a volcano. This was a force even an ascetic's endurance couldn't withstand. Crack! Lumian's body cracked, shrinking into a palm-sized mirror. The mirror shattered completely, fragments scattering across the ground. In the room diagonally opposite, Lumian materialized beside Franca, wearing a solemn expression. Had he not prepared mirror substitution beforehand, he might have endured a double explosion of emotions and desires. It resembled the same outcome when evil God bestowed heard the symphony of hatred's different melodies. Of course, if Franca hadn't been lurking nearby, if he hadn't readied mirror substitution, he wouldn't have used himself as bait to converse with Flores. Lumian seized Franca's shoulder, his voice deep as he uttered, Let's leave this place first. He promptly activated the black mark on his right shoulder, in an attempt to teleport away. Confronted with an adversary capable of exploiting his weaknesses and latent dangers, Lumian's initial response was to switch to support, utilizing his corresponding abilities from a distance. Franca would assume the role of the main attacker. However, considering Franca, a demoness of pleasure, hadn't indulged herself for a long time, he feared she might not resist the explosion of desire. It seemed prudent to retreat, regroup with others, and return later. At that moment, a voice alternating between masculinity and femininity echoed in Lumian and Franca's ears. There's no rush to escape. I've changed my mind. I want to make a deal with you. A deal? Something jolted in Lumian's and Franca's minds. After some thought, they chose to stay put. Simultaneously, Lumian sank his consciousness into his right hand, ready to activate the remnant aura of Blood Emperor Alistair Tudor. This wasn't meant to intimidate Flores, but if his emotions and desires were triggered again, Lumian could alert the police in time. Being one of the Fana Potter Kingdom's primary ports for trade with the southern continent and a key base for the Harvest Fleet, Port Kala undoubtedly housed at least one grade one sealed artifact even without a demigod. Franca gazed at the wall and the air in front of her questioning, what deal? Flores, dressed in a floral shirt, casually pushed open the unlatched door of the apartment and spoke in a deep, cold, and dignified manner. Let me introduce myself, Nabordisli, a demon. A demon? A genuine demon. The cost of using the authority holders under the table transaction actually materialized here to make a deal with a demon. However, Lumian's acceptance of the captain's mission and our pursuit of Delilah are distinct matters. If we had opted to patiently wait a month or two before engaging with Delilah instead of utilizing the authority holders under the table transaction, what would have transpired today? Could there have been a so-called deal? Franca smiled in surprise, suspicion, and confusion. How can you reveal yourself as a demon? Shouldn't a true demon conceal their identity to lower our guard? The demon, identifying himself as Nabordisli, clenched his right fist and pressed it against his lips. He smiled and replied, A true demon is both demon in body and mind. I'll inform you that you're dealing with a demon, but refusal isn't an option. I won't obscure my identity to achieve my goals like the foolish ones. For instance, this man named Flores is well aware of the consequences of repeatedly reciting my true name through the notebook. Henhe back then that foolish warlock labeled it the love incantation, but he still couldn't resist the temptation and couldn't control himself. Haha -ha for demons, this gradually decaying soul that slowly descends into the abyss is the most delectable feast. 
The sensation of resistance and constant decay is as unforgettable as the finest wine. Lumian and Franca didn't disdain or ridicule neighbor Disley's unabashed and alluring depravity. Since a demon had spoken, there had to be a deeper motive. Moreover, Lumian couldn't be certain if Nabor Disley was a genuine demon or a self-proclaimed one. He couldn't verify if Nabor Disley was his actual name or if he had a different origin. Although the activation of desire aligned with the traits of a Sequence 5 desire apostle of the demon pathway, it wasn't exclusive to demons. Lumian's symphony of hatred could achieve a similar effect. Franca grinned at the demon's incessant narrative and remarked, that foolish warlock probably assumed your true name as a love incantation because of your cues. Is that really your true name? That's why he's foolish, Nabor Disley replied with a faint smile. Lumian wasn't eager to rush into the transaction. Instead, he inquired, How did you manage to convince Flores that the love incantation actually works? Nabor Disley casually glanced back at Flores's rented apartment and assumed a relaxed posture. He tried some other incantations from the notebook, and some of them worked. He's just an ordinary person, yet he can cast an incantation like a warlock? Franca expressed disbelief. Nabor Disley grinned. I've heard a very reasonable saying, all things possess godhood. No matter how ordinary a person is, as long as they're willing to pay the corresponding price, they can create beyonder effects. All things possess godhood, Mr. K often says this when preaching. Lumian observed neighbordously, the self, proclaimed demon. Franca seized the opportunity to ask, what price did Flores pay? Neighbordously smiled meaningfully. I already told you. The part where the soul gradually decays and falls into the abyss, Franca nodded thoughtfully. Lumian suddenly grinned. If he hadn't paid the price, how could you communicate with us so easily using his body? Nabordisli smiled back but remained silent. Lumian shifted the topic. Did you have a hand in the deaths of those two adventurers who were investigating Flores? Consider it a bit of interest, Nabordisli replied, glancing around. He smiled and pulled a chair over, casually remarking, You lack the necessary courtesy. Because we never considered making a deal with you, Franca deliberately stated. I won't make a deal with a demon. Nabordisli chuckled and said, Although it's amusing for a demoness to claim she won't trade with a demon, I can assure you that I won't force you into a deal. I won't even hinder you from informing the Church of Earth Mother about Flores later. I differ from my inept peers. I prefer transparent trade, avoiding the convoluted legalese of contracts where terms and conditions are twisted. I'll make you choose to trade with me, even knowing the content and price. I decline, Franca replied with a smile. I refuse to entertain your deal. Nebordisly narrowed his eyes dangerously, but maintained his usual amiable demeanor. You can listen first before deciding if you want to accept this deal. I won't boast that I can fulfill any of your wishes, but I can help you fulfill most of them. This is a promise from an ancient demon. Ancient? Lumian looked curious. Have you heard of the ancient sun god? Nebordisli's expression darkened subtly. I'm aware. Can you tell me about him? The deity I believe in now seems to be the resurrected him. Lumian's lips curled up, revealing two rows of pearly white teeth. This can be used as compensation for the transaction, but it has to be paid first before we fulfill the contract. Don't think of fabricating it. That would be blasphemy to my lord. Nabordisli fell silent. After a few seconds, he smiled and said, As I mentioned earlier, I can't accomplish certain things and fulfill certain wishes. This is one of them. When one's humble enough, it's really difficult to win a war of words. Lumian sighed inwardly and turned to Franca, silently inquiring if she wanted to seize this opportunity to the table transaction. Franca hesitated for a moment before addressing Nabordisli. Tell me about the deal first before I decide. Nabordisli chuckled. A wise decision. I hope you can help me kill another demon's descendant. He resides somewhere in the Berserk Sea. Don't worry, demon descendants are cold, cruel, and bloodthirsty. 
he definitely meets the death penalty standard in your hearts. Then why don't you do it yourself? Franca clicked her tongue. You seem quite powerful. Is it because you're sealed, or could it be that he can't leave the abyss and can only project himself onto a human like now, unable to maintain it for long? Nabordisly replied calmly, any abnormal movements from me will attract the attention of the other demon. The reward for this transaction is that I fulfill one of your wishes. It's a predetermined wish that I can fulfill. Can you help us digest the potion in our bodies? Lumian probed. Nabordisly shook his head. I won't lie to you. I can't do it. The digestion of the potion is a personal matter. Of course, I can create conditions and opportunities to indirectly help you digest the potion as soon as possible, but whether you can seize those opportunities depends on yourselves. Quite honest, Franca muttered silently. Suddenly, she revealed a bright smile. This deal tempts me, but I need a reliable and powerful witness. Chapter 618 Divination Ritual you can request the deity you believe in to bear witness when signing the contract, but I don't want anyone else present. A chuckle escaped Nabor Lee's lips. I'm a demon. I need to be careful to avoid becoming prey. We can recite a god's name as a witness when signing the contract. The temptation loomed over them both. For ordinary Bayonders who held faith in the eternal blazing sun or the god of steam and machinery, invoking a deity's name as a witness might offer no more than psychological comfort. True gods rarely intervened in such trivial affairs of ordinary Bayonders without a proper ritual. Yet, as minor arcana card holders of the Tarot Club, Lumian and Franca followed the great existence Mr. Fool. Simply invoking his name could draw attention a fact not lost on them. Franca's heart raced with uncertainty. Should she strike a deal with the demon under the watchful gaze of Mr. The Fool in exchange for elusive benefits? Nabordisly reiterated his stance. This is a fair transaction. There's no coercion. It's the same for you and me. If you insist that there must be a powerful witness present, I choose to give up. Just as Lumian contemplated the idea, Termiborose's resounding voice echoed within his mind, It's best if you don't agree, don't even make a false promise. Lumian found himself taken aback as Termiborose, an angel of inevitability, unexpectedly warned him about the unfolding situation. Alarmed, Lumian pushed aside thoughts of Termiborose's possible intentions, choosing instead to focus on scrutinizing Nabordisli's every move and assessing his own mental state. The more Lumian delved into the matter, the more alarmed he became. Initially planning to teleport away immediately and seek help, he and Franca had gradually shifted their stance, considering Nabordisli's propositions and exploring potential exploitations. Their plan had evolved from seeking the presence of a powerful arbiter like Madame Judgment as a witness to contemplating a deal without one. Now all they hoped was to ensure their safety by invoking a god's name. Compromising one step at a time, changing bit by bit. This is very similar to Nabordisli's description of degenerating bit by bit, slowly rotting one's soul before ultimately plunging into the abyss. It also said that demons aren't just about the body, but also about the mind. Lumian swiftly snapped out of his reverie, sensing a possible influence from Nabordisli on both himself and Franca. It resembled the signs of a spectator's presence. Similarly, he could glean insights through Anthony's self-examination technique. Even in this state, Franca displayed remarkable control over her emotions. She turned to Lumian, seeking agreement. With thoughts racing, the corners of Lumian's mouth curled up slightly as he addressed Nabordisli. We don't require a witness, but I need to confirm something first. What is it? Nabordisli's demeanor remained cold, yet his attitude was composed. Lumian nodded at Franca, conveying that he would handle the situation. Franca, in turn, silently acknowledged her understanding. Turning back to Nabordisli, Lumian stated, I need to verify that the name you're using now, the name you'll use in the contract later, is indeed your real name. Deliberately avoiding the term Nabordisli, Lumian exercised caution to mitigate potential risks. Nabordisli pondered for a moment before responding, Sure, 
As a demon, I don't just dislike, but also admire your caution. Lumian maintained his smirk. The way to confirm is magic mirror divination, a complete one. We'll set up a ritual and seek answers from a hidden entity. As you know, my friend is a demoness. She's quite skilled at this. Lumian pointed at Franca as he spoke. Indeed, we should confirm if Nabordisli is the demon's real name. Otherwise, the deal would be a joke. Franca suddenly became alert, realizing she had been too eager to conclude the deal and had overlooked many potentially problematic details. Nabordisli pondered for a moment before agreeing, All right, but I have to observe from within the wall of spirituality where the ritual takes place. This is a demon's caution. We're worried that you'll use magic mirror divination to inform certain demons' natural enemies. No problem, Lumian said with a bright smile. To complete magic mirror divination, I want you to write your real name on this note and bring over the ancient notebook from the opposite room. Together, they can act as a medium for divination. Nabordisli, well versed in the intricacies of complete magic mirror divination, responded with a smile, no problem. He stood up, taking the note from Lumian's hand. Using Flores's fountain pen, he inscribed a complex word with the pronunciation Nabordisli, its language unknown. The self-proclaimed demon then left for Flores's rented apartment, retrieving the ancient notebook and the note. Lumian had already arranged a simple ritual, placing three candles and a mirror on an empty table. Before Nabordisli returned, Franca approached him and whispered, the usual magic mirror divination target. Lumian shook his head, indicating they weren't. Softly uttering a single word, he said, him. A pure male pronoun. Franca's pupils dilated as she tacitly understood whom Lumian was referring to. The implications were self-evident. After Nabordisli handed her the ancient notebook, Franca smiled happily and said, Demons are likely higher-level godhood creatures. I can't afford to be negligent. I plan to seek answers from a more special entity. Inevitably, my companion will need to assist me during the ritual. I hope you can understand what you'll see next. If you're unwilling, we'll abandon this transaction. She didn't make it sound too firm, making the abandon the transaction option seem more like a negotiating strategy. Nabordisli smiled and replied, No problem, I've seen too many special rituals. His implication was clear if there was a problem with your ritual, I would be able to tell immediately. Franca sanctified the ritual silver dagger and created a wall of spirituality. Lumian placed the ancient notebook and the note with the real name in front of the lit candle and mirror, using a small amount of Gardner Martin's spiritual blood to draw a few complicated and strange symbols. Observing from a distance, Nabordisli muttered, seeking guidance from fate, questioning an entity in this domain. Lumian seized the opportunity to turn around and ask, what can I do to dispel Sala's infatuation with Flores? Nabordisli smiled meaningfully and said, Either they both perish or they seek my approval. With the preparations complete, Franca stepped back, gazing at the three burning candles and the palm-sized makeup mirror. She recited an honorific name in ancient Hermes. The fool that doesn't belong to this era. Upon hearing this, Nabordisli's expression changed. His face turned icy and his eyes revealed a chilling cruelty. Just as he was about to project Lumian and Franca's figures in his eyes and ignite their desires and emotions, he realized that a thin gray fog emanated, making the two targets indistinct and challenging to lock onto. Lumian gripped Franca's forearm. In mysticism, this signified that the two people in the ritual were one. Of course, the prerequisite was that the original ritual host didn't resist. Lumian took over the ritual host's position and recited the last two paragraphs. The mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. The thick gray fog surged even more visibly and Nabordisli, manipulating Flores's body, grew increasingly malevolent. He tried to break free from the altar, attempting to shatter the wall of spirituality, but the gray fog stood as an impenetrable obstacle. Lumian advanced two steps, presenting the note with the real name to the candle symbolizing the ritual's host. 
he ignited it and flicked it three times, dispersing ashes onto the ancient notebook. After these preparations, Lumian spoke in a deep voice, I beseech your assistance. I implore you to banish the creature named Nebordisli. Nebordisli, in control of Flores's body, opened his mouth, emitting a sharp cry. Simultaneously, filth, depravity, and evil ravings echoed in Lumian and Franca's ears. Each word seemed to assault their minds, causing their bodies to contort and their souls to decay. Yet, under the ritual shield and the layers of gray fog, the words appeared distant, as if emanating from the horizon. Even if Lumian and Franca strained to listen, the specifics eluded them. Amidst a faint shriek, pitch-black gas emanated from Flores's body, swiftly dissipating. Faces emerged from the pitch-black gas, mouths opening and closing, cursing Lumian and Franca vehemently, only to dissolve into the gray fog. In a matter of seconds, the pitch-black gas completely vanished, and Flores's demeanor and aura returned to normal. Exorcism spell. In just a few days, Lumian had employed the exorcism spell once more. From his perspective, Nabordusli, hiding his true form somewhere, had stealthily infiltrated Flores's breath for control. He was akin to a wraith evil spirit possessing another. Most surprising was the effectiveness of the name Nabordusli. Of course, if this wasn't the true name, if the exorcism spell proved futile, Lumian could resort to Mr. Palm, fool's complete honorific name to intimidate the demon and drive it away with the gray fog and the gaze of a great existence. This time, it wasn't Mr. Fool's seal on his chest that answered, but the great existence himself. Lumian forced a smile and said to Franca, This fellow is less formidable than the invisible child of God of the Great Mother. Despite Nabordisli's frenzied curse affecting his desires and emotions, requiring him to endure with his ascetic powers, it still paled in comparison to the invisible child of God's ability to partially breach the gray fog's protection of the ritual host, repeatedly creating a psychic piercing effect. Franker remained silent, her gaze fixed on the makeup mirror serving as decoration. In the mirror, a faint fog permeated the air, and a vague figure approached from a distance. Chapter 619 Chronicles In the distance, lights flickered, accompanied by indistinct honking sounds. W.H., Franca's pupils dilated, and her eyes widened in astonishment. Her heart, previously gripped by the effects of Nebordisli's frenzied curse, now surged with shock. Instinctively, she focused all her might on the figure trying to pierce through the layers of gray fog and unravel its face and clothing. However, the thin fog grew hazier, dissipating along with the fleeting images it carried. In just three to four seconds, the mirror on the altar reverted to its normal state. What's wrong? Lumian turned to Flores, who lingered in the residual gray fog, seeking an update on Franca's condition. Franca, still captivated by the mirror, fell silent for a moment before speaking. Did you see the scene reflected in the mirror? I did. Lumian reflected briefly and suggested, perhaps it signifies Mr. Fool's divine kingdom. Their prayers for the exorcism spell had been directed towards Mr. Fool. Therefore, the mirror used to deceive Nebordisli, while being ineffective in actuality, was likely related to Mr. Fool. Franca stammered, B, but the backdrop resembles the city before your sister and I transmigrated. It's like those foggy times every building morphing into colossal creatures nestled in the fog, adorned with countless glowing eyes. Lumian, understanding Franca's emotions, showed no surprise at the familiar street scenes. Reminding his companion, he said, Don't forget about the celestial worthy. He has a close connection to your homeland and he and Mr. Gutter's Fool have been engaged in a dream battle. It's quite conceivable that such dreamscapes can manifest in reality through rituals. Franca fell into a momentary silence before releasing a sigh. You're right. She followed with a self-deprecating laugh. I got worked up for nothing. Lumian mitigated the negative effects from Nebordisli and methodically extinguished the candle flames, concluding the ritual. As Franca dispelled the wall of spirituality and the wind howled, clearing away the lingering gray fog, Flores seemed to snap back to reality, no longer lost in the confusion of searching for an exit. 
However, upon seeing Lumian and Franca, his face turned an even more pallid shade. Just as he was about to plead for mercy, a sharp pain shot through Flores's body. Instinctively, he lowered his head and observed a black, almost ethereal, filthy liquid oozing from his body. Highly corrosive, it swiftly dissolved his blood, flesh, and bones. No, save me, save me. Flores unleashed a blood-curdling scream, repeatedly calling for help. Lumian, however, observed with interest, as though studying the toll exacted on those who made a deal with demons. In less than ten seconds, Flores's body succumbed to corrosion, collapsing with a resounding crash, immersed in the almost illusory black liquid. Flores's head continued to wail, his voice gradually fading. After a while, he breathed his last with wide open eyes. His relatively intact head swiftly disintegrated into the filthy liquid. The once illusory liquid lost its evil, mystical aura, revealing the remains of the corpse, now filled with a foul, noxious mud-like substance. Dealing with demons doesn't end well. Franca sighed, reflecting on her earlier temptation. Her laughter echoed hollowly as she continued, Thankfully, we didn't strike a deal with that self-proclaimed ancient demon. Still, I missed an opportunity to eliminate the latent threat of using the authority holders under the table transaction. Lumian chuckled and remarked, Consider this carefully. I remember Madame Magician's usage instructions, emphasizing the possibility of encountering transactions with evil entities like demons. Recall, it was about encountering a transaction, not completing one. You faced it. You simply chose not to accept it. That fellow didn't force you either. Franca contemplated the situation and admitted, You make a point. It does seem that way. She clicked her tongue and glanced at Lumian. If you had chosen the lawyer path, you might be equally promising. In reality, I believe that's the norm. The authority holders under the table transaction is, at most, equivalent to a sequence 5. Every use means one less opportunity. How could the negative effects be a transaction with a demon? From what I know, demon is a high-sequence term within the criminal path. What does it signify? It represents a demigod. Yes, it's merely encountering a transaction, not completing it. There's room for negotiation. Yet, it's also highly dangerous. Demons and other evil entities aren't known for their philanthropy. If we refuse to trade with them, why would they spare us indefinitely? Furthermore, predicting when we'll encounter them is impossible, making it challenging to prepare in advance. Lumian smiled. If you can't predict it, try approaching it differently. After using the authority holders under the table transaction, immediately prepare and take the initiative to create an opportunity to negotiate with demons and other evil creatures. Set the pace and manage the risks. For instance, invite demons to St. Vive Cathedral for a deal. The Eternal Blazing Sun Church's main cathedral in Trier, St. Vive Cathedral. Franca chuckled. Demons aren't brainless zombies. Why would they willingly walk into St. Vive Cathedral to meet their doom? Franca suddenly halted. St. Vive Cathedral might not be suitable, but they did have a few hidden locations with a similar atmosphere. It wasn't entirely impossible. For example, the sacrificial square on the third level of the catacombs, Chrismona Knight Pillar. That's an interesting idea, Franca commended Lumian. In the past, when facing the negative effects of mystical items, we always endured and waited passively. Taking the initiative is a different approach. Hunters indeed have their own unique styles. Taking the initiative involved making preparations in advance and minimizing potential dangers. Of course, taking the initiative didn't necessarily mean triggering the effects, but it required considering such possibilities. Lumian glanced out the window. Flores's scream has likely attracted the attention of the nearby residents. Someone may have called the police. Let's vacate this place before examining the contents of this notebook. He gathered the ancient notebook, candles, and other items from the dining table as he spoke. Agreed. Franca surveyed the room, and dark flames silently ignited in various spots. As the flames flickered, Lumian teleported Franca away, returning to the guest room of Captain Pedro's five-story house. 
Go through the notebook and check if there's a way to dispel the love incantation. I'll verify Sala's condition and inform Pedro about Flores' situation and outcome. He can handle the Church of Earth Mother and liaise with the local police. Lumian handed the ancient notebook to Franca before opening the door and stepping into the corridor. Franca settled into the recliner and opened the notebook. Suddenly, she murmured to herself, something feels off. Knowing Lumian's approach, shouldn't he have immediately perused the notebook after the ritual, searching for a solution to dispel the love incantation? Why did he hastily leave the moment the police were mentioned after discussing matters with me extensively? He should be aware of the critical issue. As these thoughts raced through her mind, Franca suddenly came to a moment of realization. Neighbor Disley's chilling rants and wild curses had a disturbing impact on Lumian, stirring up his desires and emotions. Despite his attempts to endure the onslaught using his ascetic powers, subtle signs of struggle manifested. Franca's eyes darted around, a sly chuckle escaping her lips. Lumian found Pedro in the small living room on the first floor. Before he could delve into Flores's situation, the captain exclaimed in surprise. Mr. Barry, Sala came to me a few minutes ago. She was crying in fear and pain, saying she dreamt of falling in love with Flores and couldn't wake up. However, she suddenly woke up tonight, feeling like it was a nightmare, and she wishes to annul the engagement. May I know how you did it? Pedro spoke with a touch of unconscious politeness. She's back to normal? Could it be because Flores is dead? No, more likely Nabordisli's expulsion through the exorcism spell has restored those affected by the devil to normal, Lumian guessed, smiling. Flores is already dead. Did you kill him? Pedro, showing no aversion to the idea of killing, was even more intrigued by the fact that Flores's death seemed to have awakened his daughter. A demon killed him. Lumian briefly recounted the events, avoiding mentioning Nabordisli by name. Instead, he handed Pedro the love incantation note tucked into an ancient notebook for a closer look. Finally, he said, you handle the rest. It's advisable to keep Sala in a cathedral or cloister for the next month or two. I'm uncertain if the demon will revisit the former victim once he recovers. Understood. Pedro clenched his teeth, his expression somber. After receiving the 20,000 gold Risso bounty, Lumian returned to his guest room. Franca, holding the ancient notebook, frowned as she said, This doesn't seem like the notebook of an evil warlock. It's more like a collection of a novelty hunter's chronicles. It contains various legends of devils and demons from the northern and southern continents spanning the past thousand years. The last record appears to be over a hundred years ago. There are peculiar incantations scattered within, as if fabricated. One of them mentions a legend of a demon on Hanth Island in the Berserk Sea. Lumian grasped Franca's concern. Nobordesli had mentioned that the demon descendant he sought to eliminate resided somewhere in the Berserk Sea. Chapter 620 Abnormality in the Abyss Franca tersely acknowledged and said, in a world where superpowers exist, where true devils and demons roam, many related legends must be true or have originated from the true prototype. Do you think Nabo, uh, the demon who claimed to be ancient, might be the protagonist of one of these legends? And the demon on Hanth Island is its archenemy, living in the real world disguised as a human. It lied, claiming the other party is a descendant of a demon and tempted us into taking risks to achieve a certain goal. Perhaps, Lumian smiled, let's not speculate about such matters involving high-level creatures. I'll just write to Madame Magician and report it to her. Franca glanced at Lumian and chuckled. You're really proficient in dealing with management. However, it does make sense. We know very little about real demons. Making wild guesses is a waste of time. She then pointed at the notebook and said, the handwriting differs from the note that wrote the love incantation. It's not the same author. Lumian had already sat at his desk, unfolded a piece of paper, and wrote to Madame Magician. As he deliberated over his words, he responded to Franca's words, Does the notebook have the phrase that represents the love incantation? I scanned through it. Nothing, Franca replied affirmatively. 
Lumian contemplated for a moment and said, There are two possibilities. The first is that the demon used someone under its control to insert the love incantation into this notebook that records devil and demon legends, hoping that it could secretly spread and affect more people. The second possibility is that those who once read this notebook were unknowingly influenced by the demon and obtained a so-called revelation. They wrote this love incantation and provided commentary. Mysticism sure is dangerous, Frank aside with emotion. Lumian swiftly composed the letter and dispatched the ancient notebook and the note with the love incantation to Madame Magician. While awaiting a response, Franca and Lumian briefly delved into the demon legend of Hanth Island in the Berserk Sea. Thirty years after Emperor Roselle discovered a safe sea route to the southern continent, numerous mysterious deaths of colonists and natives plagued the newly colonized Hanth Island. Witnesses claim to have seen a valley ablaze with sulfur flames in the island's forest. At night, pitch-black demons with goat horns were suspected of circling the area. After the authorities intervened, the mysterious deaths ceased. The owner of the notebook that chronicled the legend even attempted to explore the forest, but he failed to locate the alleged valley burning with sulfur flames. As they conversed, time passed. The doll messenger arrived with Madame Magician's reply, the ancient notebook, and the love incantation note. Lumian illuminated the gas wall lamp and began reading. Franca didn't hesitate and leaned in. It's impossible to determine its true name with just the fact that the name Nabordisli could expel that fellow. This is because it admitted, in a short period of time, that it was its real name. Even if it's lying, sometimes under certain circumstances, admitting something makes it the truth. It possesses the corresponding mysticism connection. This is one of Mr. Ryo Fool's authorities. Ammon too could do it in the past. As you prayed directly to Mr. Proin Fool and used his power to exercise Nebordisli, it doesn't matter if it's its real name. It won't affect the final outcome. Do you understand? Termiboros's warning was correct. You have to be cautious even if it's a false promise. If it's truly a demon and its true name is indeed Nabordisli, the problem ends up more complicated. Since the fifth epoch, demons active in the human world have either taken the form of sealed artifacts or come from Andariel, Berea, or Noise. Demons without surnames in their true names are often ancient or come from the abyss where devils and demons reside. As for the Abyss's current state, Emperor Roselle's diary has mentions of it. Upon reading this, Lumian turned to Franca. In the curly-haired baboon's research society, he often observed others trading Emperor Roselle's diary. When the April Fool's members were still active, they would even recite the relatively comedic parts publicly. However, having joined the Transmigrator organization only recently, he had no interaction with translations from the past. He had no way of knowing what abyss-related matters the emperor had recorded. Franca said with a solemn expression, Emperor Roselle once found the entrance to the abyss and conducted a thorough exploration. As expected of Emperor Roselle, Lumian praised instinctively and sincerely. There weren't many people he admired in fact, very few, but Emperor Roselle was one of them. Knowing that this emperor was a transmigrator like his sister made him feel an affinity with him. Franca continued, In the abyss that Emperor Roselle explored, devils and demons had long perished. Not a single one remained. All he saw before him were either corpses or silence. This state made him feel fear. He left in a hurry without completing his exploration. All dead? Lumian frowned slightly. Is the love incantation fellow either not a demon or an ancient demon from the abyss's core? Pausing momentarily, he added, If it's really an ancient demon, it might know why the abyss underwent such an abnormality. Franca nodded solemnly. The duo cast their gazes at the back of Madame Magician's reply. I reckon you've already grasped the gist of the abyss from the Two of Cups, so I won't dive deeper. Simply put, Nabordisli could be a potent demon who slipped out of the Abyss's anomaly, or it might have roamed the northern continent before the three major devil clans Noise, Berea, and Andariel held sway. It didn't pledge allegiance to any ancient gods, whichever way you slice it. 
But dealing with an ancient devil king who's fled back to the abyss isn't something the two of you are capable of, let alone striking a bargain with it. You can explore the demon legends on Hanth Island if it's on your route, but stay cautious. Remember, the abyss's corruption is potent. It can corrupt people without their awareness. During this time, be vigilant for changes in your thoughts, concepts, emotions, and desires. If you notice anything unusual, consult a psychiatrist for confirmation. If you're genuinely affected by the abyss aura from Nabordisly, contact me or judgment. Experts skilled in purifying such influences will assist you. Avoid burdening Mr. Fool unnecessarily. Thinking about the name, Nabordisly, is okay, but refrain from writing or reading it. After reading the letter, Lumian mumbled to himself, Madam Magician seems more inclined to believe it's a demon and not some other hidden entity. That's right, Franca echoed puzzled. Let's assume that fellow is a demon, yet it doesn't even have danger premonition, allowing us to complete the preparations for the exorcism spell. If we say it isn't, it can create fluctuations and trigger our desires and emotions. I was just guessing that it's a secret entity that possesses a grade 1 sealed artifact of the demon pathway. Lumian pondered for a few seconds and said, Perhaps Madam Magician has seen more. That fellow probably doesn't have danger premonition because its true form isn't here. It only descended with a sliver of its aura and power. Or perhaps, the danger originated from Mr. Fool, so it couldn't sense it. That makes sense, Franca agreed before saying with a strange expression, ever since we became minor arcana cards, we've increasingly come into contact with the depths of the mystic world. The demoness sect, the mirror world, the war of the four emperors, the great mother, and a demon of the abyss this time. In the past, when I read Emperor Roselle's diary, I often had the feeling that that's just how the world is. But now, the contents of his diary have truly come to us. Without waiting for Lumian to speak, Franca added in a self-deprecating manner, for example, a demoness does taste pretty good. Lumian chuckled and remarked, think about it carefully. Did you encounter these things after becoming a minor arcana card holder or after getting to know me? Ah, uh, Franca's lips twitched. You know yourself well. Two days later, Lumian, Ludwig, and Lugano boarded a long distance ship set to pass by Hanth Island en route to the southern continent's West Balam. Lumian aimed to investigate the demon's legend and seize an opportunity to fully digest the conspirer potion. After outsmarting Nabordisly and banishing it with the exorcism spell, Lumian realized that his potion digestion had made significant progress. With another decent performance, he could advance the digestion further. This would eliminate the need for the final advancement ritual's aid, allowing him to plan the subsequent matters more calmly. Captain Pedro, accompanied by his eldest daughter Sala, and a few favored and blessed, expressed sincere gratitude to Lumian. They watched as he ascended the gangway with his godson and servant, boarding the ship named Berries. Once the ship set sail, one of the blessed appeared to sigh in relief and commented, he's finally left Port Kala. Without waiting for Sala to inquire about the reason for the sigh, the blessed, wearing a brown priest's robe, turned to her and Pedro and advised. The circumstances at the scene of Flores's death indicate that this matter involved a true, high-ranking demon. Miss Sala, it's best if you stay in the cloister for a year to avoid any possible aftereffects. Sala, aware of her awakening thanks to the adventurer Louis Berry's assistance, was horrified. However, lacking personal experience, she inquired, A year? A real demon? What kind of demon is that? The blessed, in a brown clergyman's attire, responded solemnly, It's the demons from the legends you've heard of, or something even more powerful. W.H. Sala turned to her father with a face filled with fear, confusion, and disbelief. Did you guys save me from such a demon? Pedro was equally surprised. He had never imagined that his daughter's situation would involve such a terrifying existence. And Louis Berry had only received 20,000 gold risat. No, he actually succeeded. 
Pedro, having witnessed the adventurer Louis Berry's strength through the colossal wave he created, could now grasp his power more vividly in this direct comparison. In the first-class cabin suite aboard the Berries, Lumian handed the ancient notebook and the note with love incantation to Ludwig and asked with a smile, Is it edible? 